Your Excellency, Dr. Tani, colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, and dear entrepreneurs, it's a great pleasure. It's working. I to take part in this session here in the UAE. The UAE is known for its innovation and its technological advance. And so there can be no more place more fitting to talk about digital and the digital advances than here. So thank you so much to our hosts who are also so instrumental in helping us to bring you young and successful business women and men uh, together uh, for uh, this event. I'm glad we were able to get a man. <laughs> Digital technologies are shaping the future of trade. This transformation carries significant implication for businesses and governments all over the world, bringing challenges, but also important economic opportunities and enabling greater inclusiveness. This is also the case in Africa, where challenges are sometimes more important given the digital divides, but at the same time, the opportunities, I would argue, more significant and the rewards more considerable and long lasting as a stellar cast of African digital entrepreneurs here will show us. The connectivity boost during the pandemic brought an estimated additional 782 million people online between 2019 and 2021. The number of internet users, even in the least developed countries, increased by 20%. E-commerce has also soared, and the activities and reach of digital platforms have expanded significantly. Digital transformations are having a particularly notable impact on services trade. The accelerated uptake of digital technologies is causing a further expansion of trade in services. Indeed, a broad range of services can now be supplied effectively over digital networks, from professional services to education, financial, health services, etc. Before the pandemic, cross-border trade in services was already expanding at a faster pace than trade in goods and global exports of digitally delivered services have led the way. They've more than tripled since 2005 to $3.7 trillion in 2021. That is why you hear me say that the future of trade is digital. It is green and it is inclusive. Digitalization raises prospects for services-led development and provides new opportunities for exports and diversification for developing countries. Digital trade can help increase Africa's participation in global commerce and provide new opportunities for growth within the African continental free trade area. While the continent suffers from the digital divide, as I've said earlier, and as reflected in mobile broadband coverage and internet use, ICT uptake is growing rapidly, and the pandemic has pushed a greater proportion of the continent's fast growing population to digital payment and purchasing platforms. This offers significant business and trade opportunity for digital entrepreneurs. Digital entrepreneurship will translate into trade opportunities as digitalization holds the potential to significantly lower trade costs for a wide array of goods and services and facilitate access to foreign markets. Digital trade in Africa is helping make trade more inclusive by providing increased opportunities for youth, women, and mismis, micro, medium, and small enterprises. Digital trade within the African continental free trade area will help boost the prosperity of the continent. We need to listen to young digital entrepreneurs on the continent so that we can help set up the international co cooperation and domestic policy frameworks that will facilitate their business endeavors. This is what Eleni was alluding to. We need to be looking at catalyzing digital trade opportunities for the benefit of young digital entrepreneurs on the African continent and elsewhere. That is why I'm so happy that our digital entrepreneurs are here. Excellencies, e-commerce and digital trade are attracting heightened attention at the WTO. 
At the WTO's 12th ministerial conference, WTO members agreed to extend the long-standing ban on customs duties on electronic transmissions. This outcome was fundamental in preserving a trade policy environment that is supportive of e-commerce. Further discussions on the moratorium will continue in the lead up to our 13th ministerial, which will be held here in the United Arab Emirates. At MC12, minister, ministers also decided to reinvigorate the work program on electronic commerce. These deliberations remain a key tool to share experiences, deepen our collective knowledge, and help guide members' actions. The other avenue of work on e-commerce that attracts a lot of attention concerns, of course, the negotiations under the Joint Statement Initiative or Plurilateral, where a group of 87 members, including many developing countries, are working to develop global rules on e-commerce. So we have a burgeoning e-commerce sector, but we do not have the global rules that will assure a level playing field for those participating in this trade. Well, these e-commerce negotiations by 87 of our members will help us lay the rules for global trade. The negotiations will yield common disciplines to facilitate remote transactions and strengthen trust in digital markets, from e-signatures and paperless trade to e-contracts and online consumer protection. They will also help us tackle digital trade barriers. Discussions on the e-commerce moratorium, the work program, and the e-commerce negotiations are attracting a lot of attention at the WTO but e-commerce really is permeating all areas of our work. The reasons for this are obvious. This heightened attention is a reflection of and a reaction to the transformations that are taking place in the global economy and our societies, transformations which we heard a lot about from Professor Klaus Schwab this morning. What we need to do is to see how we can further support and promote the transformations in this area so we can create the right environment for more digital entrepreneurs while supporting those already in the space to scale up. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Ngozi. Um, always incredible to hear your wisdom um, and also how you plan to enforce some of the ideas you have. Just to repeat that you, you said digital services trade is growing faster than the pace of actual goods, trade of goods on the continent. And that is absolutely, firstly illuminating, but vital because it shows where the trend um, is going. I'd like to now call on uh, His Excellency, uh, the Minister, Dr. al to share some thoughts with us, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me start by uh, uh, welcoming my dear friend, Her Excellency Dr. Ngozi to the UAE. It's going to be our pleasure to work throughout the upcoming 12 months closely with her and with the member states to uh, ensure a success, uh, uh, successful outcomes comes out from the ministerial meetings 13 uh, of the WTO. Uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, distinguished entrepreneurs from Africa. We're looking forward to work with you from here, from the UAE. And uh, uh, as uh, Her Excellency been explaining the digital uh, sphere and how things has been progressing, but even earlier this morning, we saw the opening remarks speaking about how AI technology are going to transform most of the sectors that we're, uh, uh, we're uh, dealing with on a daily basis, especially the media, etc. So if we don't use the technology, and, tr and trade, trade is going to be uh, behind. Quick numbers globally. The technology has been, and digitalization has been shifting the way that things have been run. If you look at the uh, last 20 years, services has been growing much faster than uh, trade and goods, basically because of the technology. And it has been captured and very well used by many of the developed nations. And we at the developing part of the world, if we don't expedite the usages of technology, we're going to be uh, behind and the technology is evolving on a daily basis and things has been, are changing in a much faster pace. From, from the African side in particular, Africa is one of the most uh, 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 blocks or areas around the world which, has, which, which is very rich with young generation. And ensuring the employment and ensuring creation of jobs in such a market is going to be very challenging. 
And the only way to penetrate that challenges is to go through trade, and digital trade is one of the way of doing so. Looking at Africa in general, Africa is on the brink of uh, tech explosions. Online sales in, in Africa are growing at around 25% year on year, one of the highest rates in the world, which more than 10, 10 million people start to buy online each year. Consumer spending is, is expecting to grow, especially in the upcoming uh, uh, 10 years. And the Africans, uh, 522 million internet users today are expected to expand at least by 11% on a yearly basis uh, uh, to comprise 16% uh, of the global total. How can we here at the UAE capitalize on this? And uh, just quick numbers as well in terms of the investments in Africa. The UAE is the fifth largest investor in Africa. And for us, the investment in infrastructure is a gateway to Africa, but using those technology is another boost to this uh, the relation. If we don't capitalize as well from the UAE side, the, those uh, investments and those growth that Africa is ha having, we're going to start losing our uh, uh, importance to Africa. We're the fifth largest importer from Africa, and we're the fifth largest exporter to Africa. So that, that shows how important UAE to Africa. We're go going to look, uh, we're looking forward to work with many of the entrepreneurs who are, who are working on trade and explore more uh, business opportunities between, between us. Three things which I want to mention. The first one is regarding trade technology. We're uh, kicking off a huge uh, global projects with the World Economic Forum and uh, trade technology, where we're going to ensure the digitalization is playing a major role in, in customs and uh, uh, the expedi expeditations of the process of dealing with the trades and services throughout the borders. And that is going to be one of the things which we're for sure going to work with Her Excellency Dr. Ngozi and WTO uh, over the next uh, few months. Second point, we start already having some of the dedicated initiatives to Africa. Dubai, which an initiative uh, being launched by Abu Dhabi Ports, uh, dedicated to uh, Africa, where we're ensuring that many of the commodities comes from Africa to the UAE and from the UAE goes uh, abroad so as, as one of the main hub for re-exports. The other initiatives as well within uh, DB World is the, the World Logistic Passports, where we're combining the technology uh, to the infrastructure investments that we're doing without the disturbance on the businesses or the revenues of the, of the governments. And the third point, which I want uh, to, uh, to highlight here as well, FinTech is one of the main solutions to the global lacking of infrastructure. And we've been seeing huge growth in Africa because of the maneuvering and the smart, uh, uh, smart way of dealing with this ch uh, challenges that is facing Africa by the young generation. So uh, we're going to be uh, working with you with, through the different funds that we're uh, dedicating to Africa and through the engagement that we're having uh, uh, through the different companies and means uh, here in the UAE. Uh, looking forward for discussions. Again, welcome to UAE and we're looking forward to expand the, 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 the bilateral, and, uh, bilateral uh, uh, trade and economic relation between the UAE and Africa. Thank you. Thank you. In the meantime, thank you very much for those opening comments. I'm so excited for the next session. We've got four fantastic entrepreneurs that are going to share their experiences with us. I'm going to welcome everyone to join us um, at the front of the hall, and then we'll have um, both of our dignitaries joining us as well, where we're going to engage in, in an interactive session. I'd like to first welcome uh, Ola Jumoke Oduwole, founder and CEO of KJK Africa from Nigeria. <laughs> welcome. Please join us, you'll find your name there. Um, KJK is a leading software design and development company, so we look forward to hearing your experiences. I'm going to give a little bit of information about what each company does, and then we'll get more from you uh, when you speak. Uh, Tofara Lindsay Chokero, founder and CEO of Tofara Online Zimbabwe. Um, it's a digital marketing and innovation consulting trust which aims at empowering women. Welcome. Please join us. Birame Sok, um, it is a company, founder of Quelly, and it is a company that has newly developed B2B wholesale sourcing marketplace for products made in Africa. Please join us. And Tobo Katole, 
uh, the managing director of the company Line Tutoring, 100% locally owned uh, company that employs over 330 staff countrywide and regionally as well, from Botswana, by the way. Um, it's like an Uber for tutors, if I understand correctly. So please join us. Thank you so much. Dr. Ewela, please join us. And Your Excellency Al Zayudi, please join us on stage. All right, fantastic. Lots to get through, um, and as I said, we're hoping to keep it as interactive as possible. But the things that are, are, are most interesting to me is your experience. So perhaps try and encapsulate what you're doing on the ground and some of the challenges, and perhaps even the changes that you've experienced specifically uh, since the start of the pandemic and how that's altered your experience in Nigeria and specifically. Please start. I think you've got your mic on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity again. Um, post um, the pandemic, before then, my company, KJK Africa, helps businesses and um, small organizations, um, startups, and most importantly, um, blue chip companies build software applications that can help foster their products and also give them a wider reach. So before then, everything was always done from the office. Everybody was in the office. There was no sense of you know, remote work because it wasn't the norm at the time. But as soon as the pandemic happened, we all had to stay in the door to start working. And then the synergy and the productivity just increased. And I could see the difference between when we were in the office, we had to commute, the time you used to commute, the the stress of transportation and all of that reduced by more than 80% and the productivity was more, we were able to do more work. So which meant that post pandemic, we were able to implement more products and build more software for more companies and of course improve their productivity. In, in turn, that has also improved the, the e-commerce sector too in Africa, in Nigeria particularly, because most people began to see the value in using the internet to sell their goods and services and also see that they could reach a wider range of people, not only in Nigeria, but in other parts of Africa and even outside of Africa. So those products that they had, that they were looking for in Australia, for instance, now they can give it out. Now those opportunities began to spring up in every way, startups began to look at opportunities that had to do with digital trade. We began to see fintechs that were building products for cross-border payments to make it easier. We began to see platforms building a one-stop This all during the pandemic? This yeah? was after, it, it sprung after. up after the pandemic. We began to see one-stop shop for e-commerce platforms. So now there's a platform that can help you just create your e-commerce platform just by imputing your details and then you have a shop already. So all of these things sprung up after the the pandemic and has increasingly, especially for women, who are majorly the ones that um, are the providers and most importantly, the energy builders of businesses, small businesses in Africa, now they can do much more because of this um, sprung up. Yes. Fantastic. I'm going to steal that. The energy builders of yes. businesses, <laughs> women are absolutely. Uh, Tafara, welcome. So Give us a sense of what you do and how your world has altered since the pandemic. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and it is such an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi, for hosting us. So I'm a lady um, who is running an organization called Tofara Online, which is a digital marketing and innovation consulting trust. And we are focusing on digital skills development uh, for women, youths, and SMEs. So I've developed a curriculum uh, called the Tech Driven Entrepreneur Program which is an eight modules digital marketing training, which is empowering young people in Zimbabwe and across Africa on getting the relevant digital skills for digital trade. So the reason why uh, I launched this program together with a program called the Digital Skills Incubation Program, I've noted two main problems that we had in my country and even across Africa. The issue of unemployment and also the issue of um, making sure that women get uh, access to tech skills. And it was my passion because of my history where I grew up with not, without access to tech and how it affected how I grew up. But now, reaching out to communities to help them see if they adopt tech and trade internationally, they can actually change their lives. So before the COVID pandemic, it was really difficult to sell the idea of going online, especially to women, 
because everyone in Africa was used to waking up and going to the shopping malls and sold their things. But when the COVID-19 pandemic came, to me, um, it was a sorry state because no one was really ready for things getting rotten, you know, not having income to buy food for their children. So at that moment, that is when I had to push the issue of ladies, youths, SMEs. This is now the time to know how to trade digitally. In as much as we are not ready to export our products and services, but we can sell while we are, we are at home and get an income and make sure that um, we feed our children, we get money for school fees. So um, I'm happy that from the time I started in 2017, so far we have trained more than 10,000 women and youths on digital skills development for um, international trade. So um, I'm so excited that today I'm going to also be sharing the problems that we <laughs> are also facing. <laughs> Tell us quickly, yeah. Tell us about the problems. Okay. I we are all ears yes. to solve them, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so um, I think one issue that we are not really taking into consideration is the issue of uh, data security. You know, if I capture um, information of people, um, some of the people that are getting onto digital platforms, it's easy to get data for people, but also people are not taking note of the cyber security issues, data protection issues. I think all, it's all because there is no enough awareness on um, you know, these issues. People think I can dish out you know, information that I got. And um, also the issue of infrastructure and access to internet um, in Africa is one of the things that is affecting us. What I did during the COVID-19 pandemic, because I saw that internet was expensive and um, most people could not get the courses going on on the e-digital skills platform that we had created, I resorted to creating content to be sent through WhatsApp. Why? Because it was cheap, it was accessible, I could also reach out to even marginalized communities. So I think the access to internet, which is cheap, is something that we should really work on because it is one of the challenges that we are facing. We want everyone, we want to include every community. And one of the projects that we are working on as, as well is there is no um, content that is also targeting the hearing and speech impaired communities when it comes to uh, digital trade. Those people are intelligent. In Africa, they make baskets, they make good things. But in terms of selling online, there is no content which is translated to their sign language so that they understand how they can use the digital platforms and also trade digitally. So that is what I'm... Incredible to hear your experiences. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, Birame, welcome. I was just looking at your company, Quayle, and I'm fascinated by the fact that you're helping brands improve their packaging, value proposition, to be able to compete with international markets. I think, you know, I speak for many um, on the continent trying to increase trade. It's about value add. It's about taking the raw materials and making it, you know, attractive to the global market, trying to process as much as possible on the continent. Tell me about what your company does to bridge that gap. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Ngozi, and Your Excellency, thank you for having us here. Um, really excited. So for me, Quilly, I actually was living in the United States, and um, I had two experiences in the digital world uh, with two startups there that I was able to sell. Um, and so moving back to Africa was quite an experience for me after 26 years. Um, but it was a very strong feeling that there was an opportunity here that we needed to be able to work on. And originally the idea was, we're just going to build an Alibaba for Africa. Um, and very quickly realized we needed to take a step back um, because it went beyond technology. When we speak about digital trade, and especially within Africa, we have to realize that we're speaking beyond just the, the code, the technology. Everything we do as entrepreneurs in Africa extends to the real world, to people, to logistics, to something physical. And so for us, the biggest point was, okay, it's a platform to be, it's a marketplace, so it's all digital, but what are those products that we need to be able to sell to the rest of the world? And those products are physical. And most of them, one of the biggest issues we found did not meet the standards. So I believe there's a big question around st standardization within Africa um, as it relates to just quality of the goods itself so that it can be purchased 
outside of the market we are in. And so that's where we built a brand incubation program to be able to help those local transformers who are mostly women. Some of them were even working from home in cosmetics, in food, um, in, in textile, etc. Uh, we're starting with cosmetics and food and realize we need to meet, we're basing it all based on the FDA standards because we do not have any standards to follow within Africa. Um, we also realize now we need to also work on the packaging and that requires that we go and import the packaging um, from China, from India, from Turkey or from the United States because we don't necessarily have that whole infrastructure mm -hmm. available within Africa for packaging. We do have big opportunities. Um, around all that. But I think the, the, the last sort of challenge that we also realize is on the logistics side. It costs a lot more mm -hmm. to be able to export these products within Africa than it is to bring products in. I was just reading this morning an article that was saying that uh, in Africa, the logistics is, represents 40% of the cost of the product, when in the United States, it's only 6%. Um, and so we need to figure out what that has led us to do is to say we need to have warehouses within the markets where we want to sell these products. So we go beyond technology just to be able to become a digital platform that is accessible by the rest of the world. That, that's brilliant. Um, yes. And the cost of moving goods around the continent, way too expensive and actually is hurting local industry. Dr. Ngozi, hopefully you can find a solution for that. <laughs> <laughs> Big task. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, actually true that yeah. sometimes it's easier to import, yeah. import something from, from Europe yeah. straight yeah. to an African country than taking it from one to the other. Tobo, I'm glad we could uh, find a man to join us on this. I have to say, this is the first time I've hosted a panel where men are the minority. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> An Uber for tutors. Tell me what you're up to. I'm fascinated. So first of all, thank you very much for me. My name is Tobo. I'm from a country called Botswana, uh, just north of South Africa. Um, so um, I started a business called Lion Tutoring, which is a tutoring company. Um, so I started in the year 2015. So we're just tutoring students, all curricula, your IGCSE, your A-levels, your IB. And um, it's in the year 2018 that we had our mobile app, which is like Uber for tutors. So it basically just connects the tutors anywhere in the world to the students. Just the way you would order an Uber on the platform. We have our platform on the Google Play Store. So you can even download the platform. I see most people here are parents. So you can just download the platform. So um, basically, um, when, I, when we started in 2015, it, um, we, we didn't do much in terms of sales, but after we implied our, 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 our app, or we had the app on the Google Play Store, um, we had sales booming. We also have a branch in South Africa. So we had students all over the world, as far as UK, as far as Canada. And also with the pandemic, people staying at home, they were able to connect through our platform. And through that, um, I was able to, to be listed on the, on the Forbes 30 and the 30 class of 2020. I made it on the cover and it well was done. the first for my country. Well done. Congratulations. Um, just to move things on, I think what we need to tackle is what worries you the most as entrepreneurs? What are the, the big issues that you're facing day to day in your business? Is there anything from a policy perspective that can change to make your lives easier and also give you uh, a sense of um, s uh, security that your business is sustainable in an ever-changing world. Tobo, let's start with you. Okay, Birami, let's start with you. Okay. I think, um, you know, the Whoever. first thing is with Africa, our data costs are very high. Um, I, I know with most countries, you know, for you to just get a gigabyte of, of data, you spend a lot of, uh, lot of money to get that. So you'll find that most parts of the country, uh, people have smartphones, but they're not connected to the global community because the data costs are really high. So I think from a, from a government perspective, you know, it, it really would help. Like we've seen in the pandemic, that governments are able to actually work with your ISPs to lower the, the data costs because to get more people um, you know, playing in the data space, you need to be able to get them accessed um, you know, by lowering the data costs. And also, we've, uh, we just talked about the AFCFTA. I was in her yeah. country. 
um, uh, last year and we had the AFCFTA conference, but you know, you'd find that uh, most countries um, would have signed the agreement, but they haven't ratified and they haven't really yeah. implemented the AFCFTA. So those are some of the things that governments could do to, to help. Thank you, Birame. So um, thank you. And one of the things I think for me that keeps me up at night right now is as we're growing in terms of just being able to export um, our, our African products uh, from local suppliers, what we're realizing is the demand is there and everybody's paying attention to Africa right now, especially on the agriculture side. It's the future of Africa. And that demand, in, a, in, in order to meet it, we need these local supplies to be able to grow. And they need access to the raw material. What we are finding right now is that this raw material is being exported before our local suppliers even have access to it. They do not have access to the best quality. The prices are increasing overnight for local uh, products. Last year in Senegal, we had to wait about six months of out of stock of hibiscus. Uh, cashew nuts are being exported like it's nothing. And I believe where governments uh, in Africa could help is putting in place some sort of um, uh, policies that help uh, these local suppliers have access to that raw, raw material. Do and they have the means to process those goods that you speak of? They do. Have so if the, the cashew means. nuts would stay, would they be able to process it, final okay. packaging and the whole value chain? It is working, and that's some of the work that we're doing with them in terms, of the, in terms of fixing some of the areas of the value chain. I believe on the infrastructure side for the processing, it is working. We have Chef, uh, Chef Pierre Cham, who introduced Fonio in the United States. Nobody knew about Fonio, and now he's in about 6,000 store locations in the US, Whole Foods, Target, and others. And they just received funding in order to build that infrastructure to be able to do the transformation of Fonio in Mali, in Guinea, and in Senegal. So I believe the, the funding is there to be able to do it. Because when we talk about the transformation, we're talking about industrialization. It's about yeah. funding and equipment. So I think it's more question of having access. Thank you so very much. Um, Tafara, would you like to add? I know you mentioned some of the problems that you face. Is there anything you would like to add? Definitely. Um, I think I'll also then touch on something that I'm passionate about, the digital skills development and uh, the digital literacy levels uh, that are there in my country and even across Africa. I believe that um, if we can get enough partnerships, we can actually reach out to train more people. I'll tell you how I financed some of this project. When I was still employed, I would finance the digital skills training programs using my salary. That's how passionate I was. Then uh, in 2021, I decided to move to becoming a full-time entrepreneur. That is when I realized that this is more than just me financing with what I get, but I think I can uh, build more by partnering with organizations. And I think um, currently I've got two organizations that I'm working with. One is the local Zintrade um, organization, which is grooming young people and women for export. So I then partnered with them as a consultant to also offer digital uh, skip, skills development for the people that are running through the programs. And um, I've also partnered as a consultant with ITC. I'm managing their platform, which is called Ecom Connect, which is actually grooming more than 6,000 right now e-commerce entrepreneurs. So yeah. I've then discovered through the, through the year that I was working with ITC and Zintrade, as long as we have the right partners to push the knowledge of digital skills and digital trade, we can actually make it. Because one thing, even if we want to make the policies work, even if we want the finances and all, if there is no enough literacy in the digital trade, then we won't be able to get the results that we want. So I believe that if I am to get more partners, more financiers, and making sure that information about digital trade is di disseminated in all areas, even marginalized communities, we can definitely make it. Fantastic, thank you. Ola Jumoke, would you like to weigh in? Yes, um, thank you again. Um, so at KJK Africa, because I, we deal directly with the businesses themselves, and um, 
we know the challenges that they face and somehow we were able to get on ease of doing business in 2018 in Nigeria because of the things that we see that these businesses are facing that is not allowing them scale. Because I think that the technology part of building the product itself is one of the easiest. You know, when you have done your research, it's easy to now build the technology. It's now sustaining the business to actually continue. That's now the bigger problem. So um, what that led to us building another product in Africa that bridges the gap for those that use that do not have smartphones and do not have bank accounts. Um, there's a product called Alajo. It is the digital piggy bank for the unbanked and non-smartphone user. So we help our customers use SMS and USSD to save money every day because the nation's um, savings power is actually on those people who form 73% of the nation's saving power. And these people do not have access to smartphones like they've talked about, or internet access, or some of them do not see the value of data. And these are the problems that you know, we need to see and look at and say, how do we solve these problems? And how do we look at it from the cultural perspective? Because now, for instance, there's a huge problem with trust. While building Alajo, I realized that I began to work with the grassroots population itself. That's the most people. I realized that there's a cultural problem because when policies are made, especially with the government, they don't look at the way or they don't research how exactly these people can carry out this product or these policies or these services that they want them to carry out. So it is very important that research is done deliberately on those that are actually that you are actually politicizing the products you are politicizing the the systems that you are politicizing so it is important that that man that is going to be the end user can actually use the product or implement it just the way you are politicizing like they've also said they talked about funding funding is huge i'm yeah. talking about e-commerce is the least funded um, industry in Africa, the least is least attractive to. Like she had said, it's very heavy in operations. The technology part is so easy to solve, but the other aspects that has to do with operational values, mm. manpower, skill, is definitely not getting it very attractive for people to mm. invest in. So now part of the things the international communities can do for us is to look into putting funds aside for e-commerce so that it can boom and facilitate um, digital trade, Brilliant. like you know, funding businesses that you know upscale up people in that scale, and also businesses that also help yeah. you know be people grow their e-commerce, sustain it, and so that it can continue. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the technology part is easy; everything else is tough, right? Yes. I like that line. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant, um, fantastic. Yes, Your Excellency, please let me. I want to jump here because we're one of the main investors. Have you got a microphone on? Okay. Uh, we're one of the main investors in Africa. And in the last three years, throughout the pandemic, we saw so many transformation happening in, in, the, in, the, in the sector itself. One of the main challenge is the, the capital itself. Sometimes the money is there, but we don't know who to reach out, who to work with. And sometimes some of the big uh, investors or the big business people in those countries are leaning to certain parties against the others. And uh, this is always a political decision if this is going to be supporting one of the parties against the next government, which, which might take over. Correct me uh, on that, uh, Dr. Ngozi. Uh, what, what we start noticing as well when it comes to, 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 the, to the finance, we don't have access to those entrepreneurs who really have this direct access, and they don't they, they don't think about the politics rather than coming up with a solution. Mm -hmm. Second thing, which is uh, I think the, the, my colleagues and distinguished entrepreneurs spoke about the internet access, the cost, etc. But it has been associated as well with the infrastructure itself, because sometimes it's not only the internet or the cost of the internet, the power itself. The power in some of the African countries are monopolized. Certain companies are uh, monopolizing it, and they have a power uh, uh, off for a few hours and sometimes days throughout the week, which is a, a big issue. How we're going to ensure that the technology is going to be evolved and we're going to encourage more entrepreneurs to get into this business and the infrastructure is absolutely. The other thing, why the cost movements, the cost of shipments from Europe or from all over, all over the world to Africa is more, is cheaper than the movements within the uh, Africa itself because of the infrastructure, the bridges, the roads, etc. And guess what more? The egos that we have among ourselves, we're not talking about Africa because we're, we're having the same issues globally. 
Each economic blocks are fighting against each other, but we want, we're open to work with the other parties. We are always open to export uh, stuff rather than working among ourselves. And the th third point, which I think it's another very uh, uh, crucial uh, element, is the adoptions. There are so many successful stories, but we don't look uh, uh, after the successful stories within our regions. We always want to import those excellent ideas and the accessibilities and the affordabilities, as well as the applications of such technologies can be replicated easily among the region. So we, we need a reshuffle in our thinking how to run things forward. Brilliant, thank you. Director General. Yeah, no, I, I, I really um, share some of the comments. Um, I often have uh, investors asking me who should they invest in? because they don't know the landscape within each uh, country. They don't know who to trust. And it just makes me start thinking, how do we uh, shape some vehicles that can be trusted by those from outside? Um, and at the same time, that could be set up to cater for those. They would do all the groundwork in terms of finding those who are um, you know, successful, those who are trustworthy, those who will who are credit worthy, whatever the indicators are. So it, there's definitely a problem, what you said, Your Excellency. Time and again, people have come, I want to invest, but I don't know how. Uh, that That's uh, very um, difficult. The other thing is, um, of course, you refer to the infrastructure. Uh, beyond the physical infrastructure, I mean, the, communi the um, electricity, 55% of people on the continent do not have access to electricity. And uh, we've seen two of the major economies now uh, between South Africa and Nigeria, both struggling very mightily with this issue of electricity access. So fundamentally, especially for people in rural areas uh, who are going to, if you want them to get onto these digital platforms, we have to, to solve that problem. So those are two things. And then lastly, you know, you, you I've been thinking for quite some time of how I think I'm going to try and write something about the successes uh, of successful young entrepreneurs. Because you're right, we, we always talk about the problems. We never capture those who had been successful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Your Excellency, please. Uh, I want to jump in here because, you know, uh, it is, it is a, a challenge which is going to continue if we just keep... Uh, maneuver around it, and especially when it comes to monopolizations of electricity, power, communication, etc. The, the African market is booming, and the current numbers is around 1.5, 1.6 billion people, and it's going to go to 2.5 in the upcoming 25 years. So if we're talking about monopolizations, for the current number and open it to the future one, we're going to bring best practice to to uh, the African continent. So we, we, we need to have a different way of running the policy within Africa to open the markets for the f potential future investments or opportunities within the, within the continent if we want to maintain the relation with the existing ones. Can I say something? I forgot to say on standards. This is such a big issue. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that um, we're trying to do at the WTO, you know, is uh, to try to help upgrade standards. The ITC, the International Trade Center, which is 50% uh, owned by the WTO, is working on helping uh, MSMEs uh, upgrade standards. And I'm smiling because you know all about it, right? Um, and um, we, we have other funds that can help with it's really, really important because we can't access the international markets or regional markets unless we meet certain standards uh, for our products. And, and that's such a, a brilliant point, right? Um, and it was relayed. Yeah, because it, it absolutely, we need, we need standardization. And it's, uh, hopefully that continental free trade area is going to help bring some of that policy and standardize, but it's always implementation that's the issue. Thank you so much. We have to wrap up. You're a very busy woman, apparently. I got a note you have to leave. <laughs> Thank you so very much to all our amazing entrepreneurs representing so many different parts of the continent, incredible industries. His Excellency, thank you, sir. And Dr. Ngozi, thank you.